Okay, welcome back to our series on sacred history in type and anti-type. And we're continuing in our mini-series within the series now on the typology of character perfection. Where we're continuing to examine the proclamation of liberty that is to occur throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof in the 50th Jubilee year and its connection to the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to examine more closely in our study this evening, as I've entitled our study here, Christ's Liberty Sets Us Free from Our Burden of Sin. As we consider this topic, let us Let's us bow our heads and ask the Lord for his wisdom and his guidance and his spirit. Gracious Heavenly Father, our gracious Heavenly Father, our wonderful Creator God, our Holy Redeemer, the Mighty One, the Holy One of Israel, we turn to you this night, Lord, seeking to be set free from our burden of sin. We need your true liberty, your free flowing purity in our hearts, O oh Lord, continually through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Please make this our reality, O oh Lord. Deliver us from our bondage of corruption into your glorious liberty. We acknowledge that we are weak and erring and broken sinners and that we desperately need a savior. Come close, Lord, and wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb, that nothing might separate between thee and us. We ask for the ministration of your holy angels to surround and protect us, to teach and to guide us, and to be our loving companions. But above all things, Lord, we need an outpouring and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit without measure, even with latter rain power, right now, Lord, and forevermore, that you might be with us and dwelling and abiding in us to teach us all things and to guide us into all truth for your presence through your holy spirit is the gift that we need above every other gift and the gift through which every other gift shall come and every great and precious promise shall be fulfilled even right now in this the antitypical jubilee year So we earnestly ask that you might lead out this study, Lord, that it might be your words and your thoughts and your ideas and not our own, that you might show us wonderful things from your law that we knew not as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay. A little ahead of ourselves here. So again, we're considering the passage here from Leviticus 25. Verses 9 and 10, where we see we have a day of atonement message of the proclamation of liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, that every man might return unto his possession and every man might return unto his family in the 50th Jubilee year. And we've seen in our previous studies on how <coughs> this word. Liberty is the word deror, which means liberty and especially a free flowing purity that comes from Christ himself through his great sacrifice. We've seen from Isaiah 61 and from Luke chapter 4 that this is actually the proclamation of liberty was Christ's mission as Messiah, and that he in preaching the everlasting gospel, the good tidings or the gospel to the poor and the meek, that he proclaimed liberty and the acceptable year of the Lord, the true Jubilee year. Him having done it first in his incarnation, in his fulfillment, having been the anointed one, fulfilling Daniel chapter 9 of the anointing of the most holy and giving the proclamation of the everlasting gospel that he now bids us in these last days 
to take up his mantle and to have a double portion of his spirit anointing us that he might dwell in us that god might be manifest in our flesh to be his witnesses of his redeeming love to overcome our burden of sin and the first place i'd like to examine in our study tonight on this freedom that we need is in jeremiah chapter 34 was one of the passages in which we saw in our earlier study that on the word deror or liberty where this word is found of the proclamation of liberty we see it here in jeremiah 34 verse 8 yeah, beginning at verse 8 this is the word that came unto jeremiah from the lord after that the king zedekiah made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem, to proclaim liberty unto them. And so we looked at this passage before, but I want to have an additional emphasis on being set free and what that is really means and is all about in its connection with this proclamation of liberty. We see that beginning in verse 9, that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being a Hebrew or a Hebrewess, go free that none should serve himself of them, to wit of a Jew his brother. Now when all the princes and all the people had entered into the covenant, he heard that everyone should let his manservant and everyone his maidservant go free, that none should serve themselves of them anymore, then they obeyed and let them go. But afterward they turned and caused the servants and the handmaids whom they had let go free, to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaids. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen, saying, At the end of every seven years let ye go every man his brother in Hebrew, which hath been sold unto thee, and when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearkened not unto me, neither inclined their ear. And ye were now turned and had done right in my sight in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor, and ye had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Interesting, they had now turned, they had repented, turned away from their sin in not hearkening unto the Lord, and had obeyed in proclaiming liberty and setting them free. And it had been through the covenant, entering into corporate covenant relationship with the Lord, in the house which is called by his name, the sanctuary or the temple, called by his name, his beautiful character of love. But ye turned and polluted my name, and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom ye had set at liberty, at their pleasure to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. By the way, where it says earlier, go free, go free, this set at liberty here is actually the same word that we're going to see in a minute in the Hebrew, the word kofshi. We're going to examine it closely. Uh, continuing the passage for context here, therefore thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword and to the pestilence and to the famine, and I will make you to be moved into all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me, when they had cut in the calf in twain and passed between the parts. The princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which pass between the parts of the calf, I will even give, give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of the heaven and unto the beasts of the earth. So the very punishment that God had proclaimed in Leviticus 26, if you broke corporate covenant relationship, which we've seen in our earlier prophetic studies in this series, on sacred history and type and anti-type, that he would let the enemies conquer them as punishment, as the part of the seven times prophetic punishment on his people. That this is exactly what the Lord says is going to happen to them because they initially proclaimed the liberty and set free the captives and then 
took them back into bondage and took back their word and polluted his name, his character, which is involved and invested in setting us free. So let's look at this word, kofshi, in the Hebrew. That is the word. In each one of these instances where it says go free or set at liberty, we see very clearly it's the free, the word free is kofshi. And also that one instance where it's in verse 16, set at liberty. At liberty is kofshi. And kofshi means free or liberty. That's the one instance it's translated as liberty there in Jeremiah 34, 16. Every other instance, it's the word free. And specifically, it's free from slavery and free from taxes or obligation. Exempt. Free from bondage, from tax or care. Free liberty. And so we're going to look at a few instances where this word is used to help us understand it more clearly. Specifically, these instances where in the seventh year God said to set the slaves free, which occurred first in Exodus chapter 21. So again, on Mount Sinai, immediately after the Ten Commandments were spoken by God himself from the mount, smoking with fire and with earthquake and shaking and smoke, the mount all on a smoke, and lightnings and thunderings. And he immediately goes into the judgments and the statutes. And Exodus 21 tells us, now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, Six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. That's the word kofshi, free, for nothing. That's how Jesus sets us free. It's for nothing. Nothing we can do can buy this freedom. Only Christ and his great sacrifice for us, and it's a free gift for us, for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master hath given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, kofshi. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So we see here, you have this right as a Hebrew, even if you were a slave, you could only be a slave for a maximum of six years. And in the seventh year, you were to be set free for nothing freed from the bondage of slavery. But you could choose, if you loved your master, to become a willing slave forever. And that's just as we have with Jesus. He sets us free from our bondage to sin. But if we truly love him, then we will choose to serve him forever, willingly. We're not really slaves, we're willing servants for life, forevermore, to do his will because we're so grateful that he is the one who has set us free from the slavery to self and to sin, the bondage of corruption. It also tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 15, at the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. 
and then skipping down for time's sake. And he reminds them in verse nine, beware that thou not be a thought in thine wicked heart saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother and thou givest him not and he cry unto the Lord against thee and it be sin unto thee. And he told us in verse eight, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need and that which he wanted. And in verse 10, thou shalt surely give him and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him because that this is the thing which the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all thy puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. Which was This was all of the statutes related that were listed in Leviticus chapter 25 as well on how to treat those in the seven-year cycle and letting the land rest, and also with the 50th Jubilee year and the release being set free there. And it continues in verse 12, and if thy brother and Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress, that of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. See, the flock, there is the sacrifice, the lamb for the sacrifice, and the floor is where we get the grain for the bread and the wine is obviously the wine press so we have the body and the blood of christ symbolically represented and his sacrifice it's all centered around the cross this is why we have to set them free the cross is what sets us free the cross of jesus christ and they were to remember it in the seventh year the year of release and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. Again, so here they were to remember is because they were slaves, and that God had redeemed them, that they treat others the same way. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And we... God has redeemed us. He's our great redeemer, and we ought to treat others accordingly. And God gave commandments and judgments and statutes to remember these things. And of course, it was in Deuteronomy chapter 5 when the law was repeated that the Sabbath commandment was stated not as a memorial of creation, but as a memorial of redemption that they had been bondmen and bondwomen in Egypt, and God had delivered them out of the land, so they ought to let their servants rest on the seventh day as well. Well, they also had to let their servants go free in the seventh year as a symbol of their corporate covenant relationship and of their recognition and gratefulness for God's great redemption. And again in verse 16, and it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee, and thine house, because he is well with thee, then thou shalt take an awl, and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever, and also unto thy maidservant shalt thou do likewise. And it shall not seem hard unto thee when thou sendest him away, him away free from thee, free, kofshi, for he hath been a, worth a double hired servant unto thee, in serving thee six years, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. It's even very significant that in both cases, both in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, it was to thrust him through his ear in the door or the door post. Those were the very things that God had them place the Passover blood the blood of the Passover lamb that the destroying angel might pass over them was to cover the door and the lentil, the door and the door post, which is also where, of course, they had in Egypt covered those places 
with the images of their false gods. And here, the blood of the lamb, the only, the one and only true God, covered those over, covers over our idolatry and takes it away. And then the Passover, the destroying angel can pass over us. And so here, this, be, this being set free ourselves and treating others the same way as a memorial of God's redemption is critical to our having a right salvation relationship with Jesus Christ, like being in corporate covenant relationship with him, this freedom that he wants to give us. It's also interesting, this year of release that it's talking about, the Shemitah, and we have a letting drop of exactions, a remitting, a release from debt. We saw in our previous study, just the one previous just to this one, that the Christ's liberty leads to the remission of sins. And here there's a remission of debts. causing them to cease to be detected, to be completely gone away. This is the remission that needs to take place in the year of release or remission, where the sins are being wiped out, where especially in the Jubilee year now we have the, which is the seven cycles of seven, we have the complete release, the blotting out of sins from the coming of the presence of the Lord. When we're in a right obedience, love relationship with God. And interestingly, the only time that this word year of release is used is here in Deuteronomy 15 and then also in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And that's very interesting to me as well. Let's read that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And Moses is speaking to all Israel, and he writes out his law and delivers it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders, the Torah. So here, Moses has written out the entire Torah, and he gives it to the priests who are bearing the Ark of the Covenant. And Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whither you go over Jordan to possess it. So here in this, every seventh year, in the year of release, when you were set free, you also had a reading of the law in the Feast of Tabernacles. And of course, the Feast of Tabernacles was a special time that was often associated with the inauguration or a coronation of a new king. When the, old, the former king had died and his son was to be officially coronated, they would place a crown on his head, and they would give him a copy of the testimony, the Torah, his own personal handwritten copy that he himself had written out, not that anybody else had written out for him. No scribe could do it, but he personally had to write it out so that he knew everything that was in the law and the Lord could hold him accountable as the king for seeing that the law was enforced and kept in the land and that they would anoint him as king. And it was often the case that the king himself personally read from his own copy of the Torah here in the seventh year, in the solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles. And we're going to see in some of our future studies on the type and anti-type 
in the fulfillment here in these last moments of the closing up of the Day of Atonement and the transition with the Feast of Tabernacles as Christ is transitioning from our high priest to our king where he wants to sit on the throne of our hearts and restore the lost dominion, the dominion over self and over our beastly nature and over sin that we might keep his commandments we need to remember his great redemption in the year, this year of release, the seventh year. And the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee year, when the time has come to proclaim liberty and all the captives be set free. And then another very interesting time when this word kofshi, or being free or set free is found is in Isaiah chapter 58. And of course, inspiration tells us that the entire chapter of Isaiah 58 is a special chapter, especially applicable to God's end time remnant people in church. And so let's read the passage together since it's a special message for us. It begins in verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Of course, again, we saw in Leviticus chapter 25 that there had to be a special blowing of the Jubilee trumpet in the Day of Atonement. We live in the antitypical Day of Atonement, and as that trumpet sound is being heralded throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, we have a special message of crying aloud and sparing not to show his people their transgression in the house of Jacob, their sins, to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, that sin might be put away and separated from us as we're set free, as we receive Christ's free-flowing purity and liberty in the heart and are set free from our bondage of corruption and sin. But we need to be made clear what sin is and that sin might be shown in its true hideous character and that the sin might be seen as exceedingly sinful and that we might humble ourselves greatly before the Lord and recognize our true condition before him as his Laodicean lukewarm people. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, they say, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and for debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness, ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? So here's the people, they think they're all right with God when they're actually all wrong with God. That's Laodicea. That's God's judgment time people who are lukewarm, who have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and they are perplexed at why God doesn't hear them. And they think that they've earned God's favor in all their sacrifices that they make for him. And this is the entirely wrong mindset that we need to have with God. And will God consider this an acceptable day? That word acceptable, by the way, in the Hebrew ratzon is the same word where it talks about the acceptable year of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 61, and where the proclamation of liberty by the Messiah is prophesied, and where Christ himself, also in Luke 4, quoting that, also said the acceptable year of the Lord, of course, there in the Luke in the Greek. So there's a connection here. The acceptable day and the acceptable law year is pointing to both the year of release and the jubilee year. The Shemitah 
and the Jubilee, the Yobel. And verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen, that God has chosen? Not the fast that we choose. We need to choose the fast that God has chosen for us. Is it to loose the bands of wickedness and to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? And when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. So here we see that this go free, this is kofshi. This is this freedom that's associated with the year of release in the seven-year cycles of Leviticus 25. And this is what God bids us to do. And the very mission of the Messiah in Isaiah 61, of that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon him because he has anointed him to preach good tidings, the everlasting gospel, unto the meek, to sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the same proclamation here, just stated a slightly different wording, but almost exactly the same ideas here in Isaiah 51 to loose the bands of wickedness and to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke, the yoke of bondage to sin. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ sets us free. Is it? And here, dealing thy bread to the hungry now, of course, there's a literal, literal aspect to each one of these, and we ought not to neglect caring for the actually literally poor and hungry and naked. But there's also a very important spiritual dimension to each one of these. We have the bread of the Word of God that we ought to be dealing to those who are thirsting and hungering for truth and for righteousness. And you can, you can have ones that are poor in spirit who know not the Lord, and you can bring them into your house, not necessarily your literal house, so you can do that too, but to bring them to the house of God, to our churches, to learn the truth, to feed them with spiritual bread. And when you see them naked, that thou cover him, again, while there's a per, uh, an important literal meaning there's a spiritual meaning as in with laodicea needs to buy white raiment that the shame of her nakedness not appear we need to lead people to know jesus christ and his righteousness by his faith that they might themselves become covered with his robe of righteousness the mission of the messiah again from isaiah 61 in verse 10 to clothe us with his robe of righteousness. And we hide not ourselves from thine own flesh. We need to help those around us, both in the church and in the world. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. So here, we'll get our righteousness when we receive his righteousness by doing what he did, by following his perfect example and being set free and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And we can receive his glory, his beautiful character of unselfish love. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. And thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. So we ourselves lift the burden, allow Christ to take away our burdens and our sins and set us free. And we stop being judgmental and pointing the finger and speaking proudly against the Lord. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a water garden, like a spring of water, 
the waters fail not. That's the latter rain that he wants to give us. But we need to accept his proclamation of liberty and to be personally set free from our burden of sin, that we might be his witnesses and that we might treat others accordingly, love others as he has loved us, keeping his commandments and his statutes and his judgments through his faith and receiving his righteousness. And they shall be of thee, shall they that be of thee shall be build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in the breach in the wall, the breach in the law, the hedge of protection that the Lord places around us. And to make it clear, we, there's a special emphasis on the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Turning from self-centered self-righteousness and honoring him, our lives living to give him glory, as we've seen in our previous studies. That's the perfect of our purpose of our existence. And we honor his law by honoring him personally, because he is with us. That's the only way we can actually keep his commandments. That's the only way we can actually keep the Sabbath day holy. Revelation 4, 15, 4 tells us that the only thing in the universe that is holy is Christ himself, God himself. And so we can't keep the Sabbath holy unless he be with us and in us. Only his very presence with us can enable us to keep his Sabbath day, his seventh day Sabbath, holy and live with him with delight, with the oil of gladness and joy in our hearts, not doing our own ways, which are selfishness and sin, but seeking his ways and doing his righteousness, because he's in us and doing it in us and through us. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Of course, the heritage of Jacob is the, the inheritance of, of the promised possession, the eternal life. Every man shall return unto his possession in the proclamation of liberty in the 50th year. We also have, interestingly, as we consider this idea of liberty and being set free, in Psalm chapter 119, the, whole, the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, beautiful passage about God's law and his righteousness. Um, we'll start at verse 40 for context. It says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. We need to long after God's perfect ways, his perfect law, and He. we need him to quicken us, to give us new life in Christ Jesus and to give us his righteousness, in thy righteousness, not in my righteousness, not in my improved righteousness, but through him imparting his perfect righteousness to us as we accept it by faith. And of course, in order for us to be quickened, we need to be dead, dead to self and to sin, being set free from the bondage of sin and from the law of sin and death through death to self and receiving a new life with Christ Jesus, being quickened by the Spirit in his righteousness. And then vow, let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So his great mercy and grace that makes it all possible, unmerited favor, it's according to his word, all according to his word, his life-giving, life-creating, recreating word, and his his salvation his complete restoration back into the image of god so shall i have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me for i trust thy word we need to have 
perfect implicit trust in God's word. And we're going to have a study coming up on the necessity of perfect trust in Christ and his word through complete surrender, manifest in complete surrender. And when we do that, we'll have an, a word to answer to anyone who reproaches the word of the Lord. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. We, his word is the word of truth. And Christ, of course, is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. We need Christ in us and his word dwelling in our hearts and in our minds. And we need to hope in his judgments, the time of the judgment. This is a judgment hour message. And we can delight in his judgment if we're surrendered, if Christ is dwelling in us through continually through his Holy Spirit and living out his life, his righteousness through his perfect faith in us. And we have nothing to fear in the time of the judgment. So shall, thy, I, so shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. We can only keep God's law continually, never ceasing from perfect obedience, only if he is with us and in us continually. And he's the one doing it in us and through us. We cannot do it. We need his presence with us, the coming of the presence of the Lord that our sins might be blotted out. And then verse 45 was the key one I wanted to focus on. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. What sets us at liberty? Seeking God and his precepts. Seeking Christ and his righteousness. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, and all these things will be added unto thee, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. We want to walk at liberty. Walking is a symbol in the scriptures, of course, of how you live your life. We can live at liberty, having Christ's free-flowing purity in us continually because we're constantly seeking after his precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. I will not be ashamed. We can be his witnesses in these last days as we're called before kings and before judges and leaders of the world as his witnesses. And I will delight myself in, the command, in thy commandments, which I have loved. We have to love the truth. If you love me, keep my commandments. We have to be in a true genuine love relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we can delight ourselves in his commandments. And my hands will also lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. And the hand is a symbol of what we do. This is about doing the commandments. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We can only keep those commandments truly if we have the faith of Jesus. We have his perfect faith. We are filled with faith, full of faith, faithful as he was, because he's with us, imparting us his perfect faith and his perfect righteousness. So here, speaking of his beautiful law, as we've just been looking at, James, in, in chapter 1 of his book, epistle, general epistle, tells us, beginning at verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face and natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and go his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue with therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Everywhere God commands us to keep his commandments, he never merely says to keep them. He always says to keep and to do them. God's law is eminently practical. He wants us to do it, to apply it to the life. To not just have the intellectual knowledge, to make it practical and part of the life. And it's a 
perfect law, a perfect law of liberty. It sets us free from the bondage of sin. He sets us free from the bondage of sin. It, the law shows us what is wrong. It shows us the perfect standard. But only Christ himself in his free flowing purity continually imparted us can actually set us free from the bondage of sin, free from the law of sin and death. When we purpose in our hearts and choose to do what is right. And he gives us the power, the supernatural dunamis, to actually make it reality and to follow through with that commitment in our, that we first make in our hearts. And of course, in James chapter 2, he continues on this theme, saying, if ye fulfill the royal law, beginning at verse 8, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet thou, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Again, it's called the law of liberty. We see that it's the standard of judgment. We need to both speak and do it. It's very clearly speaking about the Ten Commandments we see in verse 11. And it's all found in the principle of love. Love first to God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. As we saw in Isaiah chapter 58, that when we have the true liberty when we accept the proclamation of liberty and we are set free from the bondage to sin and from slavery to self and we choose liberty his free flowing purity with us continually through his continual presence of his holy spirit then we will love him supremely first manifest in keeping his commandments if you love me keep my commandments and we will love our neighbors as ourselves. We will set the captives free, and we will deal our bread to the poor and the hungry, and we will clothe the naked by pointing them to Christ in his perfect righteousness. And of course, this word for liberty, both in James 1 and James 2, he was speaking about the law of liberty, a nice transition point here for us. It's the word in the Greek, Strong's G, 1657, eleutheria. So we're going to have to examine this word eleutheria. And it also has two related words. Eleutheria is a feminine noun. And it is, every single instance, it's translated as the word liberty. And it includes the liberty to do as one pleases, the power of choice as we've seen in a previous study and it's especially true liberty is living as we should and not as we please that's what true liberty is and we're having, i want to focus in on the scriptures that especially focus on this idea that true liberty is living as we should and not as we please living a righteous life Thy will be done, O Lord, and not our will be done. And accepting his perfect righteousness and living it through his perfect faith. And then also we have a related word, eleuthero, which is a verb. It's the same concept, but in a verb. Eleutheria is the noun, liberty. Here is being set at liberty, the verb. And it is to make free or to deliver to make free, to set at liberty, or from the dominion of sin, to liberate, to exempt from liability, to deliver, to make free. So the same, this is a, a parallel word to the Hebrew word kofshi that we've just looked at. And it's the verb form of the word liberty, eleutheria, 
Here it is as a ferro, is the verb. And then also, there's an adjective form of the same word, eleferos, which also means free and at liberty, but it also means free man or free woman or free born. In a civil sense, one who is not a slave, one of one who ceases to be a slave, freed, free, exempt, unrestrained, not bound by an obligation, in an ethical sense, free from the yoke of the Mosaic law, free from the condemnation of the law, would be a better way to put it. This is what being set free is all about, being made a free born, free man or free woman in Jesus Christ, set free from the bondage of sin. So let's look at a few passages that especially focus on that. Here in John chapter 8 is one of the key ones where Christ himself told us, beginning in verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The word free there is the word elefero. And even the shall make is elefero. Ye shall know the truth. Who is the truth? Christ is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And ye shall know him, like Adam knew his wife. When you have an intimate knowledge of your heavenly husband, when you are naked before him, and there's no secrets between you, and when you give yourself to him to have his way with you, and he's in you and plants the seed of his word in you to bring forth new life, then you'll know the truth. And that truth, Christ, shall make you free, set you free from the bondage of sin and death, from the law of sin and death. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. And how sayest thou, thou, sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Again, we have the word for free is the word eleferos. And by the way, the word genome there in the Greek, as we've seen in a previous study, uh, in its prophetic context, it actually means to bring to pass prophetically. That's how you're made to do it. It's a, a bringing to pass of a prophecy. And that Christ was prophesied from Leviticus 25 in the Jubilee year and from Isaiah 61 as the mission of the Messiah to proclaim liberty and to set us free, free from the bondage to sin. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. We need to be made sons and daughters of God and not just servants. We need to be transformed. And we're going to have a whole study on Romans chapter 8 coming up very soon about what it really means to be a child of God, to receive the glorious liberty of the children of God. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Who makes you free? The Son, Christ. Only Jesus Christ can make us free. Their free is Eleferro, and the free down, the second free is Eleferos. Here is this being made free, both as a verb and as an adjective. Uh, if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Truly set free from the bondage and slavery to self and to sin. We understand this idea a little bit as well from Romans chapter 6 and has the same concept and the same word. And to really understand it, we need to really go through the whole chapter. So we're going to try to do that very quickly together. But it's such a powerful idea. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, beginning at verse 1, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized 
into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. What happened when Christ had his baptism? He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Just like we need to be spirit. The Spirit of the Lord God needs to anoint us that we might proclaim liberty because we personally have a testimony of being set free. We can be his witnesses with a personal testimony of being set free when we're baptized, dying to self and receiving a new life from Christ, being having him impart his life, quickening us with his Holy Spirit. And we need to die to self and to sin in order to be set free. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so shall we also should walk in newness of life. Buried unto the death, Christ was also anointed unto his burying by Mary with the sweet ointment when she broke the alabaster box. And she, and we're we're, we're going to have a whole separate study on baptism in the future to really to understand these ideas. But when Christ being anointed with the Spirit and unto his burying, how did Christ go to the cross? How, did we, how can we be baptized into his death? His death was voluntary. He willingly gave his life a sacrifice for sin. And he needs us to willingly give our lives a sacrifice to overcome sin through his death. We don't become a sacrifice for anybody else's sin. We don't. Our sacrifice of our lives doesn't free us from our sin. It's his sacrifice that we copy, that we follow, that we voluntarily choose to give up our life of sin, that we might receive his life of glory, newness of life, and we walk in it, that our lives reflect this choice. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Following the pattern man perfectly, which we've seen in our previous studies, is the pattern for the judgment of the living. That we need to all have our own personal cross experience where we fully die to self and we rise to newness in life through the outpouring of the latter rain power of his Holy Spirit to walk in newness of life. And we see they're planted together. We saw all the way back in Isaiah chapter 61 that he wants to plant us as trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And that's the very thing that's happening here. He wants to plant us as trees of righteousness, which is being planted in the likeness of his death, that we also might be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin, set free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. It's all following our perfect pattern, man, our perfect example and perfect substitute, Jesus Christ, and receiving his life by faith in his righteousness, his faith, his life by choosing to give up our lives. We have to choose it. We have to exercise the free will power of choice that has already been given us and voluntarily choose it. Then he can give us this experience of newness of life in Christ, of total transformation. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Sin and death needs to have no more dominion over. He wants to restore the lost dominion. That's what Leviticus 25 and 26 was all about. 
about who is going to reign and have dominion over us. Christ as our king or the other nations of the world and sin and self, the beastly nature. That dominion that was lost by Adam, God wants to restore the dominion over the beastly nature. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have to die to self and to sin. We need to account ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed, our Lord, with this anointing of the Holy Spirit in the proclamation of liberty. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. That was the very punishment. If they did broke corporate covenant relationship in Leviticus 26, that God would let the enemies reign over them. And the enemy, Satan, has reigned over us all our lives. We need to choose to be set free and to have the lost dominion restored by Christ our King sitting on the throne of our hearts, the anointed one, to restore the lost dominion. Now they yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It's about yielding. And again, we have a study coming up very soon maybe even our next study, uh, it's going to be about this power of surrender, this necessity of total surrender of the will to God, yielding ourselves to Christ instead of unto sin and selfishness and unrighteousness. For sin shall have not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We need to yield and obey. Whoever we obey, that's who we're worshiping. Obedience is the highest form of worship. If we're yielding to sin, then we're worshiping self and Satan. We have to worship God alone. We shall have no other gods before me. We have to yield to Christ and his righteousness. It takes a yielding, though. We have to choose it. Christ cannot impose it on us. We have to willingly choose it. We have to want it. And then he will make it our reality. But God be thanked that ye were servants, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. It has to be obedience from the heart, not just an outward compliance, but it has to be a true surrender of the heart. Being then made free from sin, Ye became the servants of righteousness. That's the word. Elefero, I believe. Elefero, yes. Being made free from sin. Set free. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Over and over again, Paul's emphasizing this need to die to self and to willingly yield, because that's how Christ died. He willingly yielded his life, and we need to do the same. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Again there, that word free is eletharos. Free from righteousness. When we were the servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. No righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin 
and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The made free of the thought all. Set free. Christ sets us free. The truth sets us free from sin to become the servants of God, willing servants. Like when they bore the ear through with the awl at the doorpost, willingly choosing to become the servants of God, yielding to him and saying, all is well with me and my family when I'm with you, Jesus Christ, because I know you love me. You're my deliverer who sets us free. Then we can have the fruit of holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Indeed. The wages of sin is death. Wages are what you get paid for what you've earned. You deserve your wages. And the wages of our sin, what we deserve is death. But the gift of God, it's a gift. We can't earn it. Nothing we do, none of this doing what's right is earning us our salvation. It's because he set us free. It's because his free-flowing purity and love are dwelling in us. And it's a manifestation that we've been saved, not an earning of anything. For it's a free gift, this eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Jehovah saves from sin the anointed one, our Lord, our King, the one who rules and sits on the throne of our heart. All right, pressing on, Galatians chapter 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. That's Eleutheros. This idea of liberty and being set free, but as a, in your status of being free in Christ. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. This being set free, this receiving of the proclamation of liberty and being set free from the bondage of corruption of sin and into the glorious liberty of Jesus Christ is a gift of promise. Just like the gift of the promise of Isaac was an impossible, an impossibility by any human standard. This overcoming of sin and really living a life free from sin to the glory of God to be his witnesses, it, it's impossible by human standards. We cannot do it of our own selves, but we need to believe it just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And Sarah believed as well, it tells us in the book of Hebrews. She laughed at first, but she came to truly believe and that's why she was able to conceive seed. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, or Hagar, for this Agar, or Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. You might say today, which answereth to God's remnant Laodicean church, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. The remnant is in bondage, brothers and sisters, because they have not received the true everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. That sets us free. That this true Lateran message of Christ's righteousness by Christ's faith, which has been resisted since 1888, when the message was first given in clearness to the people. We need to humble ourselves before God and deeply repent of our sins and receive his righteousness by his faith, by receiving his very presence in us, which can only be there if there's no sin there. There cannot be willing sin in the heart and Christ dwell there. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Eleutheros. 
the Eletheros, the liberty sets us free. And it's the Jerusalem that is above, the new Jerusalem, Christ's bride, married to Christ in a perfect union, the two flesh becoming one, him uniting his divinity with our humanity, which begets us unto a lively hope, born again in Christ Jesus, true born again experience. We see these two covenants, these are speaking about uh, the two covenants of humans in response to God's everlasting covenant. God does not have two covenants. God, the covenant of the Lord, is there's only one covenant. It's the everlasting covenant. God's one-way promise that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sin of the whole world, to make this liberty and being set free possible for us. And then human response to God in seeking to enter into a covenant relationship with God, we need to pledge obedience. And either you pledge it by recognizing your weakness and relying completely on Christ and his Holy Spirit, or you say, all that the Lord has done, we will do and obey, believing that you can do it in your own strength through a righteousness by works. The two covenants, one's righteousness by faith and one's righteousness by works. Mount Sinai with gender is the bondage, which is Agar, the son of works, Ishmael, is righteousness by, represents righteousness by works in the allegory. And the son of promise is the one who's is accounted unto them for righteousness because they believe. We need to believe that God can truly set us free. He can do it. Not that I can do it. He can do it. He's accomplished it because he did it, because he gave his life willingly and lived a perfect life of surrender and obedience, that he can manifest the same experience in us, in our fallen human nature now. And we need to believe. This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. John 6:29. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. That desolate brings us all the way back to Leviticus 26, the very first time that the word desolate appears in the scriptures. But that when we recognize our desolation, uh, we're barren without Christ, that he can give us new life when he becomes our husband now we brethren as isaac was are the children of promise but there as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now nevertheless what saith the scripture cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman eletheros so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free, of the feros. Because we believe on him who he has sent. And we can be born after the spirit and not after the flesh. Again, we're going to have a whole study on Romans chapter 8 on this idea between the flesh and the spirit. And getting, becoming the true children of God through his glorious liberty. And finally, Galatians chapter 5, as we wrap up. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Liberty there is eleutheria, and made us free is eleuthero. Confirm that, but I believe that's absolutely correct. Yes, liberty, eleutheria. And he made us free, Elitharu. He's the one who does it. Who makes us free? Christ has made us free. He is the one that gives us life, and we need to stand fast in it. We need to stand up for Jesus Christ and be his witnesses. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, of corruption, and sin. 
Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Of his righteousness by his faith. That's our hope. That's what we have to believe, and it's through the Spirit that we receive it, that Christ dwelling in our hearts, abiding in us and with us continually through the Spirit is how we can attain to his righteousness by his faith. For in Jesus Christ, not a circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a faith which worketh by love. So beautiful summary there of what righteousness by faith really is. It's righteousness by faith works by love. It manifests in the life. The just shall live by his faith. Their lives reflect his faith. His perfect faith and his perfect righteousness manifest in the life. And love has to be the motivating factor that brings it about. We cannot attain unto this if we simply are striving to do it because it's what we're told to do, because it's our duty, because I want to get to heaven. None of this can be the motivation. It has to be true love, a true love relationship with the one who loves me, the one who died for me. We love him because we first, he first loved us. We need to behold him on the cross, suffering for us, willingly choosing to suffer and die for my sins and see his great love and choose in return to love him and to manifest that love through obedience to all of his commandments. Okay? Choosing it and surrendering all to let him work out his will and good pleasure in us and through us. And it's for in Jesus Christ, in Jehovah saves, salvation is of Jehovah, from our sins in Christ the anointed one who then anoints us to have this experience and then of course a little bit farther down for brethren verse 13 ye have been called unto liberty of a feria. only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh but to love but by love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This liberty that we're called unto, we're called unto liberty. The proclamation of liberty has gone forth. First from Christ himself when he came to this world, and now in these last days, in this antitypical jubilee 50th year, the proclamation of liberty is to go forth again from witnesses who have had the experience of being set free and do not use it as an occasion to go back into sin of the flesh, but love one another. It manifests in love for Christ in obedience to his commandments and love for one another because the, all the law is fulfilled and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How we treat one another, just as it was in Isaiah chapter 58 in the true fast, that God has called for us, fasting from selfishness and sin, to live a life that brings him glory. Gracious Heavenly Father, our most holy creator God, we thank you so much for this precious time that you give us in these studies. We thank you for guiding us in this study to see through a beautiful exegesis of your word, the truth of the proclamation of liberty that sets us free from our burden of sin, that your liberty, your free-flowing purity and love dwelling in our hearts, manifesting in freedom from the burden of sin, from the yoke of bondage, that we might testify for you and be your witnesses and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. We give your name glory that allow you to glorify your own name in us and through us to vindicate your name in these last moments of earth's history 
that you might get the victory for us, both us personally and through all of your people corporately over the enemy in the great controversy. May it be so, O Lord, may it be now is our prayer. For we ask it and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.